one of the reasons why we think interacting with nature is beneficial is that we think that interacting with nature can restore our ability to direct attention. So one of my mentors, Steve Kaplan, he, he came up with this idea of attention restoration theory that humans kind of have two kinds of attention. One kind of attention is called directed attention, okay. where you as an individual person decide what you're going to pay attention to. So presumably, Paul, you're deciding to pay attention to what I'm saying, but you could probably find other things in the environment that are more interesting than what I'm saying. And it's That's not that- true in the slightest, Mark, <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> um, and it, unfortunately, this ability of humans to direct their attention, we think is fatigable or depletable, that we can only sort of focus our attention or direct our attention for so long. That's different from another kind of attention that we call involuntary attention. And that's the kind of attention that's automatically captured by interesting stimulation in the environment. So bright lights, loud noises, those things automatically capture our attention. And we don't really hear, uh, we don't really have a lot of control over that. So the idea is if we can find environments that don't place a lot of demands on directed attention while simultaneously Um, activating this involuntary attention, we might be able to restore or replenish this precious directed attention resource. Well, one of the quotes that you talk about is that directed attention is central to our humanity. So if indeed that's true, are we at risk if we pay less attention to something that's central to our humanity? Yes. Some of the telltale signs of fatigue directed attention are irritability, being unable to concentrate, People might be getting a little bit more aggressive, Okay. Um, not having a lot of impulse control. Um, so we think it, it, it could underlie a lot of different problems if you're not uh, sort of giving yourself these, these breaks of, of, that involve involuntary attention. If you're constantly trying to push directed attention to its limit, there's going to be consequences to that. Okay, I'm going to go deeper in just a moment on a this concept of interacting with nature, but I want to get another baseline term onto the table here. And this is one that you also spend a lot of time talking about, which is soft fascination. Can you expand yeah. on that for me a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two kinds of ways to activate involuntary attention. Okay. So one way which we call soft fascination. It would be like, if I look at a waterfall, it's really interesting. It captures my attention. I typically don't say, wow, I'm too tired. I can't look at that waterfall anymore. Our involuntary attention is automatically captured by that waterfall, but you can still kind of mind wander and think about other things while you're looking at the waterfall. If I'm walking in Times Square, wow, that's also really fascinating, really interesting. It captures my involuntary attention, but it sort of does so in a very harsh, all-consuming way. I can't really folk, I can't really mind wander or think about other things while I'm in Times Square. So we think it's critical that the kind of stimulation that captures involuntary attention be softly fascinating. And we think that many natural stimulation, like waterfalls, rivers, uh, leaves swaying in the wind. Um, one thing I guess I would say too is that nature is not necessarily the only kind of stimulation that might be softly fascinating. It's possible like okay. walking through a museum uh, with really beautiful artwork could be softly fascinating. Uh, you know, maybe going to the symphony could be softly fascinating. Maybe even reading certain books or something like that could be could be softly fascinating. So it's any kind of activity that sort of activates involuntary attention in ways that aren't sort of all consuming. The other thing that I think is important is that we don't want to mix soft fascination with preference. So. When we do some of our studies, people say, well, I don't really like nature very much, um, but they can still show improvements in their attention after interacting with nature. So you don't really even have to like the nature or necessarily like the softly fascinating stimulation to kind of get this benefit. But the thing about softly fascinating is me sitting in the dark is not softly Uh fascinating. That may be relaxing. (laughs) but it's not softly fascinating. So that's not going to cut it, is it? No. And in fact, Tim Wilson and uh, Dan Gilbert and some other people did some studies where they had people sit in a room alone and people really hate that. In fact, uh, 
some of the students in their studies were willing to administer themselves electric shocks <laughs> to not be alone with their thoughts. So sitting in a dark room is boring and boredom is fatiguing. So you ha- th- th- this process of soft fascination is an active process. We're not saying don't do anything. But you said something that I want to pull on a second. Many people, you said, are un- so uncomfortable being alone with their own thoughts that they'd rather give themselves an electric shock. Tell me about that. And and I, I'm not surprised, but you don't really ever hear it articulated that way. You know, there could be a lot of reasons for that. You know, um, oftentimes when we're kind of in quiescence, uh, you might start to ruminate and think about problems and things like that. But that can actually be useful. And being in a constant state of distraction might be beneficial for short periods of time when something bad happens. If you have a breakup or you do poorly on an exam, maybe it's good to distract yourself uh, in those moments for a little while. But distraction only works in the short term. It doesn't work in the long term. It's kind of interesting that we've done studies with uh, participants who have clinical depression And we thought initially, well, maybe if you send a person who's got depression on a walk alone, they're just going to ruminate on their problems and they're going to be worse off. But we actually found just the opposite, that the results were even stronger for participants with clinical depression. On the positive side, On the positive side, yes. And it it wasn't that they were not thinking about their problems. It may be that, again, when you go out in nature... If you're restoring your directed attention, you may be giving yourself the cognitive resources necessary to kind of think about your problems. And and it takes resources. It takes energy. It takes cognitive energy to to think about these problems. We talked a little bit about folks that were either not depressed or depressed going and taking the walks and being in nature. But you also kind of really dig into this idea that the benefits, there are mental health benefits, not just attention benefits of coming from a walk in nature. Explain those a little bit more for me. Yeah. And we think this is that it's all kind of tied together. So, you know, people with depression have really strong attentional problems. It's very hard for people with depression to focus. Um, And so when we did our study with participants with depression, we actually found that their attention uh, and their working memory performance increased quite a bit after the walk in nature, uh, maybe breaking this kind of ruminative uh, cycle that they're sort of in. 